Hi, everybody. Welcome to Leveraging the SAT Data for the New Hampshire High Schools, put on by the Department of Ed, and also with demonstrated success. You can you want to go to the next slide. Karen's all happy smiling there. Karen, <laughs> your presenter today. Hello. I am the moderator. I'm Ann Mordecai. And we, you can, we're, you're going to get a copy of this PowerPoint so you can read about us if you want to. Next slide. Thank you to the DOE because this is important and it's nice to have all this information for free. Um, thank you to everybody who's stuck through this ridiculous year and we're almost at the end. So thank you for your dedication to all the students. To start or during the whole webinar, everybody will be muted. At the end, we will, um, if there are questions and you wanna ask them, we'll unmute you. You can raise your hand and we'll unmute you. During the webinar, please ask questions. Um, I'll stop Karen. I'll be monitoring the question and answer section, the Q&A section and the chat section a little, but not as much. So if you have a question, put it in the Q&A and I will uh, stop Karen and ask her. And tomorrow you'll get an email with a link to the professional development certificate, a link to the video of this webinar, the PowerPoint and any other documents that Karen goes over today. So thank you. Okay, is that it? Yes. That is it. Okay, thank you, Anne. So hi, everybody. It's nice to, well, I can't see you, unfortunately, <laughs> but I hope you're all doing well um, on this lovely, almost summer day. Um, we're going to, sorry about that. I just want to check one thing, Karen. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. I'd love to know if you can hear us. So if you oh, yeah. can, send us a little um, yes, I can, or something in the uh, chat or the questions. Thank you. Thanks. All right. So today we're going to talk about the content of the SAT and how to understand the data that you're looking at and where you can find different results. And also we'll talk about some protocols to use those results. So we're going to start by talking about the background and the structure of the SAT assessment. And Anne's going to keep her eyes open right now because if you guys could flood the chat with your different questions, that would be fantastic. Um, I'm not guaranteeing I can answer all of them, but we can also talk to Melissa White at the New Hampshire Department of Ed and assorted other incredible people, and uh, we will get answers to all of your questions. So feel free to right now flood the chat and Anne will um, interrupt me and we can share those questions. For now, I'm gonna keep going. So I am assuming that you all know <laughs> that there were several testing windows and those were the testing windows, right? This here. Um, the results are ready in College Board, according to College Board. So you can access those results right now as we speak. Um, and that's really good information. And the link below is a link to updated SAT information in the state of New Hampshire. Okay. And just, I'm assuming many of you know this, but we are all required in New Hampshire to take the SAT with essay as our 11th grade state assessment test. Okay, and obviously this year was a little crazy. Um, I mean, last spring rather, this year we took it. Last year, um, we did not. So um, that is that. The Obviously the growth data is impacted and some of our data reporting is impacted from those gaps. And, um, you know, students take the test digitally. You can have accommodations for IEP and 504s. Um, this is just some information for you that's passed, right? But who you can go to, to, um, to talk about the need for paper test materials. And um, you can choose any testing windows, which I'm sure you have. And um, most of this has passed already, but it's good to have on a slide so that you know going forward. So here we have the structure of the SAT. And um, there's a total score, which you can see at top that ranges from 400 to 1600. 
And then that score is based in two sections or divided up into two sections, evidence-based reading and writing and math. So the evidence-based reading and writing is broken up into reading and writing and language. So you can see that in that sort of left-hand square. Um, on the right-hand square, I want you to look and you can see that the essay is broken up into three sections. For every section, you can get between two and eight points. Okay, so what happens is there are two raters. So it's really between one and four points for each section, but then they double it because there's two raters. So that's sort of the basic structure. And you can see on the left, the scoring structure. So for the two main sections, you're looking at anywhere between 200 to 800 points. And then for each subtest, the reading, the writing and language and the math, it's between 10 and 40. And then underneath there, you can see analysis in science and analysis in history and social studies. And this is a really cool thing about the SAT is that they've taken the items from across the tests and aligned them. So the passages in particular in terms of how they um, align content wise. So if in the reading section, you read three science passages, right? They cull that, right? They aggregate that information just for the science focused passages and just for the history social uh, history passages. Okay, so then underneath, there's another layer of subscores. For reading, if you travel down vertically, you get a score for words in context and command of evidence. For writing and language, you get a subscore around expression of ideas and conventions. And then in math, you get a subscore for heart of algebra, passport to advanced math, and problem solving and data analysis. So that is the general structure of the assessment. How are we doing on questions, Anne? I have no questions yet, Karen. Okay, thanks. Um, we're going to go over the content a little bit, the evidence-based reading. So the range of text complexity is from ninth through post high school, freshman year of college, basically, or beyond, right, a year after. Um, it, the emphasis is on using evidence and reasoning to support inferences. Okay, so it's, it's really, I mean, the emphasis really aligns with the Common Core standards, basically. Um, this use of evidence and source analysis. And obviously kids are asked to incorporate data and use graphics. So, and sometimes they can get pretty complex. The words in context focuses on word choice uh, with a lot of emphasis on tier two words and phrases and tier two words and phrases are basically your academic vocabulary. Um, there is a researcher named Avril Cox Head who um, has created an academic word list that if you want to know more about tier two vocabulary specifically for high school and college, I would visit that. She's, uh, she's Canadian. I can't remember what university she's out of, but tier two words are basically your um, most widely used academic words and language. Tier three is more content based and tier one is your everyday language use. And as I said earlier, it includes the uh, reading passages include literature, science and social studies texts. And there's always a paired passage and single passages and associated questions. So this is the sort of um, logistics around the reading test, the content specifications, this document. So you can see that the, the kids have 65 minutes. Okay, there's four single passages and a pair passage. There's 52 questions. You can see here what takes up the most space, right? So they have um, all of them multiple choice. All of them are passage based. And words in context, 19% of the assessment um, assesses words in context, 19% command of evidence. And then you see the history and the social studies breakdown. Okay, and then it tells you- Karen, 
Yes. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you in the middle of a sentence. Okay. Um, what was the name of the author again of the study? Abr Abril Coxhead. Okay, thank you. Uh, oh, I wish I understood. I remembered rather um, what university, but she's definitely out of Canada. And it's the academic word list. Okay. So this is just a, a sample passage, which is reminding me, Anne, <laughs> we're going to have to do that math passage again. <laughs> oh, yes, that's right. Okay, so we'll work through that. And that's why Anne's really here. She's not here just to moderate. She's here to help me with the math. <laughs> um, so here is, you know, this is a this is a sample of the language, right, that, that the kids are working through on the SAT. And I, I really appreciate the text complexity on the SAT. Uh, SAT, I think it's a very good reminder for all of us to continue to give our kids um, passages that have, a, that have really complex text. Because if we don't do that, they're going to be totally unaccustomed to this level of text when they, when they take the SAT, which as we you know, all know is an important test for them, not just for accountability purposes, but for their, their future. Um, oh, whoops, I didn't uh, read it. So now we have to read it because we're actually going to take a test question. Uh, so you guys, why don't you give a read? Um, I'm going to read it out loud just to pace us. So today I'm an inquisitor. A hyperbole would not be fictional and would not overstate the solemnness that I feel right now. My faith in the constitution is whole. It is complete. It is total. And I am not going to sit here and be an idle specter spectator to the diminution, the subversion, destruction of the constitution. Who can so properly be the inquisitors for the nation as the representatives of the nation themselves? The subjects of its jurisdiction, jurisdiction are those offenses which proceed from the misconduct of public men. Okay, so the main rhetorical effect of this series of three phrases in lines five through six, the diminution, subversion, the destruction is to. So the rhetorical effect. Okay, so you guys, everybody who's on this webinar, can you write in and think about what you think the main rhetorical effect is, A, B, C, or D? What'd you get, Anne? Well, we're getting some A's right now. A couple of B's, come on people. All right. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, okay. 4, 3, 2. A is the winner. A is the winner. And I'm glad about that because A is the right answer. So that makes us all feel good. <laughs> okay. There we go. Okay. Suggest so the increasingly increasing seriousness. And so you can see here that there's a lot involved, right? The kids may not know the diminution, the word diminution. They, they're more likely to know subversion to destruction, but even if they don't know the meaning of each individual word, right? They can sense in the paragraph if they read carefully um, the answer. So this is the writing. This is, a, we're gonna look at a sample writing task. In, in the writing um, expression of ideas, Students have to revise and edit text. They have to make connections. Um, they revise extended texts. It's a lot of grammar, usage, usage punctuation. It's, it's definitely the easiest thing to teach because it's just sort of memorization. Um, and so here's the writing and language test component. So it's only 35 minutes and there's only 44 questions. And you can see here half of it, 55% is expression of ideas and then 45% is conventions. You can see the words in context, the social studies and the science breakdown. And that there's four passages, each with 11 questions, right? So you can see all that. And we'll do one together. Are you ready? I'm gonna read it out loud. A 1954 documentary about renowned watercolor painter Dong Kingman shows the artist sitting on a stool on Mott Street in New York's Chinatown. 
A crowd of admiring spectators watches as Kingman squeezes dollops of paint from several tubes into a tin watercolor box from just a few primary colors. Kingman creates dozens of beautiful hues as he layers the translucent paint onto the paper on his easel. Each stroke of the brush and dab of the sponge transforms thinly sketched outlines into buildings, shop signs, and street lamps. The street scene Kingman begins composing in this short film is very much in keeping with the urban landscape for which he is best known. So what do we change? What needs to be corrected? Is the answer A, B, C, or D? You could write in, that would be fabulous. Thanks. What have we gotten, Anne? Yeah, you know, I'm talking away to myself. I forgot to turn my speaker on mm -hmm. um, or my microphone. Uh, A's, B's, mostly B's, I'd say. Mostly B's. Okay. And you can see here at the bottom, um, the content is conventions, right? And then the objective is they have to create two grammatically complete sentences. Okay, survey says B, right? That was pretty easy. So that's a bit of a freebie for our kids. All right, the essay, they have 50 minutes to write the essay. They receive three separate scores, one in reading, one in analysis, and one in writing. And you can see here, the goal is to reflect how well the writer of the essay understood the passage, okay? So the, the, the writer, okay, is the student, right? And so they're being scored on how well they understood the meaning of the passage, all right? The analysis is, it reflects how the author, the writer, which is the student, okay. Oh, sorry, the author of the original text. So they're asked to evaluate the original text's author, okay, and that argument and how that author used evidence and reasoning and stylistic strategies. And then for the student, the essay, the student's essay, right, develops the claims and is focused and organized and precise. Okay, so they're, they're asked to do a lot of different things and pay it over here at the bottom, right? You can see the essay rubric. So I would encourage you to go there and look at the rubric that they use to score the essays. I also want you to all to know that kids can access their essays and you also can access their essays. So if you wanna take the SAT essay and continue with it in your class, I highly recommend that. Um, and, you know, as a way to help kids prepare for the SAT, you can integrate it into your instruction to make it more meaningful for the students. So again, we have 50 minutes. Okay, and here are the breakdowns. And this is just a sample prompt. Obviously, we're not going to write an essay, but um, as you read the passage, consider how the author uses evidence, reasoning, and stylistic and persuasive elements. And this is the prompt. And it's a pretty, it's pretty much the same prompt all the time, right? So you're gonna explain how the author builds, this, builds an argument and um, to pers persuade their audience of their claim. So it's not the student, you're, the student is actually analyzing the original writers um, argument and claim and their efforts to build that claim and appeal to the audience. In the student essay, they're gonna analyze, right? How the original author used any of the features listed, okay? To strengthen the logic and the persu persuasiveness. And then, you know, this disclaimer, your essay should not explain whether you agree, but it's an analysis of the original essay. Okay. For math. So uh, I would say that the, the, the main focus of math is on algebra and linear equations, okay? And then in addition to that, the emphasis is on problem solving and data analysis. And then more advanced mathematical practices is, is lesser of a focus, but still present. 
And so you can see here that students are asked to, you know, reason and apply math and their skills. Um, they're solving problems from a range of um, integrated scenarios, real world problems, situations in science, social studies and careers. There's a calculator and a no calculator portion. And everything in the calculator portion can be solved without a calculator. Um, and that sort of feeds into the scoring process because sometimes like when you're using the calculator, it may take you longer, um, you may run out of time. So you're better off if you can, probably not using the calculator. Um, and there's multiple choice, but there's also student produced answers. So up here we have the domains, right? So there's a lot on the heart of algebra. And in there, we're focusing on linear equations and fluency. Hey, Anne, are you here? I'm here. Can you talk to me about linear equations? Um, it, what do you want to know about it? It's just I don't know what linear, if you teach algebra or even eighth grade, seventh grade, sixth grade, you, you know what linear equations are. They're equations that would create a line on a um, four quadrant graph. Does that make sense? Yeah, thanks. Yep. Just a little, you know, <laughs> it's good to you haven't, you haven't had eighth grade math in a while? Uh, not in a while. <laughs> <laughs> haven't taught it to anybody. I haven't done any PD around it. So thank you for, for clarifying that. I know the rest of you must know. But I just thought I'd take advantage. Um, problem solving and data analysis. So, you know, ratios, proportions, rates, um, data, synthesizing data, analyzing data. Um, the passport to advanced math, you know, quadratic and exponential, exponential functions and procedural skill and fluency. And then the additional topics are geometry and trigonometry. Um, far less of an emphasis on the assessment. So you can see here, the, um, the emphasis is really on heart of algebra, okay? Um, there's 58 questions and almost all of them except for 13 are multiple choice, but there are 13 open-ended, okay? Or student produced responses. And you can see here the calculator portion is 55 minutes. The non-calculator portion is 25 minutes. You have 80 minutes total. There's 19 questions for the heart of algebra, the problem solving and data analysis, 17, and then passport to, passport to advanced math. The additional topics is only six questions. So like your geometry and trig, um, that is just six questions. So it's good to know. And the analysis in science and social studies um, is drawn from the math questions as well. So calculator and no calculator, as I said earlier, um, the calculator portion really provides insight into like the appropriate use of the calculator and when the student needs to use the calculator and chooses to use the calculator. Um, it's definitely complex reasoning, but again, it, it, it definitely includes questions where the calculator is a deterrent. So that's a good thing to let your kids, you know, your students know about. And then the, no cal the non-calculator um, focuses a lot on fluency and um, conceptual questions where you don't need a calculator. Anne, are you ready? I'm ready, but I bet you have the answer on the next page. I do, but I can't <laughs> explain it. Okay. Um, here's, here's a sample problem. Anne and I have done this dance several times now. A researcher places two colonies of bacteria into two Petri dishes that each have an area of 10 square centimeters. After the initial placement of the bacteria, T equals zero, the researcher measures and records the area covered by the bacteria in each dish every 10 minutes. The data for each dish were fit by a smooth curve as shown above, where each curve represents the area of a dish covered by bacteria as a function of time in hours. Which of the following is a correct statement about the data above? The data is not above, the data is in the bottom left corner. 
Okay, so I'm gonna give you all a few minutes to explore this problem. And I see, I have a list of who's on and a couple of you I know, and I have some great expectations. I have the feeling at least 50% of the people on this webinar will be able to answer this like that. I am not one of them, but we have a lot of people who can check us here. Okay. Can you write in A, B, C, or D? Oh, bless you. Bless you. I'm watching you guys. We have some colleagues and friends on. Thank you. Couple more. Okay. What do we have, Anne? You know, you're muted. Where has she gone? All right. Oh, shoot. Yeah, Again, I had my mic off. We have B's and C's coming in. I am so sorry. Okay. Okay. Oh, we have to go back to the. Uh, okay. Sorry. Yeah, that's not the, that is not the answer to this question. No. Okay. Okay. Wait, why do we have B's and C's? Mm -hmm. Okay. What, what is that then? I don't know. But is that, that's not it, right? No, no, no. Go back. I don't, I guess we don't have the answer to it. We don't have the answer. But okay. it's, okay. And what's the answer? I would say it's actually could be, let me see, B or C, 50%, but I say B at the time zero. So when the time is zero, which uh, bacteria covers 10%. So that one represents 10% of the whole area of the whole area of the dish and 20%, which is where the two is of um, dish two. And dish two is covered by 100% more than, yes. Oh, that's right. So it's not C. Very good. Thank you very much, Jan. Um, <laughs> it is B. So I knew I'd get that. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. It's B, right? It's B. Okay. Dish two is covered by 100% more than dish one. Uh, no, that's A. True. Wait. No. Oh, yes. Dish B is at time zero. It is covered by a hundred percent more. Oh, that's I, why. That's why it's not C. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> You're gonna make me do this one too. Huh? Okay. I'm so sorry. I gave. I didn't even warn Anne. So yeah. I have to tell you the truth. Um. Yeah. This is another one. Should we do this one too? Depends Terrible. on how many math people are out there. <laughs> the math people can all do this. I'm gonna hope. keep going. But this is uh, another yeah, example. Keep... Okay. And here's how we did the answer, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And this problem, multiplying both sides of the equation to the common denominator. I mean, the good part, let me just say something about the examples. And I think you'll get to it, Karen, that yeah. you'll be able to see all, um, all the examples that you can see, like all the, you know, quote, released items that they have. Yeah. And that will really help you see what kind of questions they're asking. So Karen will show you that. We'll be getting to that. Yes. And and there's some really good data analysis. And maybe I'm even, where are we in time? Oh, okay, I gotta hustle. All right, here we go, because I wanna get to the data analysis. So um, just so you know, the benchmarks, right, in the math are associated with a 75% chance of earning at least a C in your first semester of your credit bearing, of your first credit bearing college course in algebra, statistics, pre-calculus, or calculus, right? So there is a correlation, they think, between these scores and your capacity to succeed in your initial um, coursework in college. And um, there's, there's two different scorings, and I'm gonna go through this quickly. It's not that relevant, but I, I want you all to know that there's sort of your classic SAT benchmark scores, but then there's also benchmark scores that relate to college and career readiness for just New Hampshire. 
and those are slightly different. Okay, but it, it's not really that much of a difference and it doesn't matter that much. So like this is the generic the top is like, this is the SAT, you know, um, nationwide. And then the grade 11, like accountability for New Hampshire is, um, is this score, okay? All right, let's, let's look at looking at the data now. So there's a lot of different places to look at this data. And I'm going to start with the College Board because I do believe that for individual students and to impact your instruction, the College Board is the right way to go. Now, iPlatform is used for more general overview of how your high school might be doing, you know, um, compared to other high schools across the state and compared to other variables. And then in Performance Plus, we do upload a overall score that you can look at as well. So those are sort of the three different places. And, you know, you can just go into the College Board record, reporting site, you're going to have an account, you're going to you're going to log in um, with a username and a password. Usually there's one person in each district. It could be a guidance counselor, it can be your tech person that, you know, facilitates this. And there's a lot of different kinds of reports. These are some of the best that I use, the question analysis, the instructional planning, and the scores and benchmarks. Okay, so you can specify the kind of report and you can choose which administration date. Okay. I'm just looking, there's a question from Donna. Is there a way to get the data for the career and college ready portion of the end of, year accountability report currently hmm. we have to look them up is, is there, there a way to data for the um i don't think accountability will be set until everybody's taken the test and they've had time to look at it um for our for new for our state accountability yes yeah well so the the results were just let um released like a few days ago but even so, let's say that we did, you know, everything was all set right now. I'm not sure how you would get that. How do you get that? Let's, we'll have to get back to you on that. I don't know if it's in P plus even. I, I can look not at that right now. For prior years. It's, I'm sorry, I looked before the webinar. It's not in P plus right now. Okay. For last, for prior years, do we put it there? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'll, okay. So it will be there then eventually. Prior years, yes. yes. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, so anyway, you know, there, you, you can, you pick your assessment date. There's, there's usually right? A school date. Um, so there would be, you know, school test day, um, April 2021, you know, that kind of thing. So you can um, select the date. Okay. okay. Oh, that's so blurry. Sorry, you're going to use the roster report to create a list of students who have taken or are scheduled to take the SAT. And you're going to print test tickets from there. Okay, in your administration, okay. That's a roster report. For scores and benchmarks, right? This gives you an overall report of how your students scored compared to the district, the state, the total group, okay? And again, I mean, you know, this is de-identified information. So this was the SAT from, you know, the May, um, the school day last uh, two years ago. Oh, so sad. Um, <laughs> and this will show you the scores and the benchmarks. And that you can see here, it gives you the, um, the math score, the evidence-based reading and writing score, and then the total score. And you can drill down even further, okay? This is the drill down. So you can see sort of um, the distribution of scores for your population, okay? This is the, the state, okay? This would be filled out for a district, okay? Now, my favorite report for the SAT is the question analysis. You can get the question analysis for the PSAT as well as the SAT. And what this allows you to do 
You can't, you can get it for past SATs. You can't always get it for the school day SAT. All right, because oftentimes they don't release those questions, but you can get it for other administration dates and you can get it for the PSAT. So what's really good about this is you can look at your item analysis and you can actually distill what the major problems were in specific items. And then you can go in and you can find items that mirror those particular items and do an analysis of those. So it's, it's really quite remarkable. You can, anywhere on here, you can see student performance. You can click over here. Do you see this number one? And actually, I think we're gonna be getting, um, we should be getting some arrows. All right, you can print the questions over here. If you click on there, you can print all the questions in the upper left corner over here. You can right here, look at each question in terms of the percentage of kids that got the questions right. So you're gonna look for, you know, let's say over here, just on this particular sample, over here only 43% of kids in the school district got this question right. And you can see the correct answer here. You can see that it's a medium in terms of difficulty. If you go up to the top over here for difficulty, it was a medium difficulty question. You can look and see how many kids, kids omitted the question. So if the correct answer was C, right, you can see that 60% of kids or 60 kids answered C, but then you can look over here and see the other how many kids chose other um, options? All right, I'm gonna go back for one second so you can see this in full for a moment. Now you can download these, and actually I have a slide later that will show you. Um, and you can put them into an Excel file to do a, an analysis. I'm just showing you here how you can filter these questions. So you can just bring up the questions. You can bring up all of them where less than 25% of kids got the items correct, where between 26 and 50%. You can just look at, and this is what I kind of like to do, is go to the medium questions only and find all the medium questions where less than 50% of kids, 50% or less, got them correct, okay? And those seem to me to be good questions to focus on. You can also filter the questions by their cross-test scores, okay? So you can look at only science, you can look at only social studies, you can look at only words and context, only expression of ideas. Now, what I like to do is download the questions to Excel and create something like this, right? Where you have the section, you have the question number, the difficulty, and this allows you to dice and slice and sort. And if I was gonna go in and do a data analysis, and we have done this with high schools many times, to go in with a, you know, you can do it online, which is great, but as we all know, when we're doing data analysis, sometimes online, people tend not to stay focused and together and you tend to sort of travel off into the details, into the weeds of what you're looking at. And so if you want to have an organized data session, I suggest that you download the questions to Excel and organize them this way. And when with this particular team that I used this sheet with, I went through and highlighted what I thought would be relevant, items that I thought would be relevant to look at. Um, because for instance, question five, 45% of kids got it correct. And you can see here that the correct answer is B, but there is, I'm talking about the first line here, the first row. There was an equal misunderstanding between A and C. So I'm really curious about that because I wanna know what that misunderstanding was for this particular item. So if we go over here for this question, the correct answer was B but a lot of kids chose, right, A, and which is if we, um, sorry, I'm just gonna go back one. 
I don't want that up yet, but there it is. Um, in terms of the writing and language usage, this is um, a different, uh, you know, different um, Excel sheet. And again, it's the same thing. Here are the question numbers. Here's the type and the percent correct. Okay. So I definitely recommend downloading into Excel. And this just highlights some of what I was just saying, right? We're going to work to understand what each question reveals about student learning. Did stu you know, what kinds of questions did they struggle with? What were the distractors that tripped them up? And then we're going to talk about how we can redefine or replan for um, instruction that addresses the weaknesses. And if we go down to the bottom, you know, just looking at your um, identifying questions that are linked to the test score, to the cross test scores and in different areas. When I have done this um, at one particular high school, we had a really good session where we were able to determine that words in context was their greatest area of weakness. And then we went back to look at all the items, we did an item analysis, and that informed their planning for the upcoming year to use um, cross-disciplinary tier two vocabulary, um, different reading, uh, high school cross-disciplinary reading strategies. It was, it was great work. Okay, so this is another report. It's called instructional planning. Oftentimes when we do data analysis for the SAT, I start here. It's a really nice report to just look overall at how your students did. So, you know, just a little color coding here. So when you, where you see green, that means that your 11th grader is, is um, he's, a, he's about to meet or is meeting the 11th grade benchmark, okay, for that range. Red means that um, he is not quite meeting the 10th grade benchmark. And yellow is somewhere in between, okay. Karen? Uh-huh. I'm interrupting because either you're doing a perfect job in explaining everything perfectly, which is probably the case, yeah. but we have no questions. And I just want to encourage people to ask questions. Okay. Yes. Okay. If they have them. Thank you. Um, so that, so, so I do, just to go back for a second, I do encourage you to start with this instructional planning and you use this instructional planning report to delve more deeply into an, a topic, right? So you're gonna look here and you're gonna look for the areas that need to be strengthened. And then you can go in to do a more in-depth item analysis within that area to look at items. Okay. And this is a growth report and it, it's not necessarily relevant for everyone on this um, session, but many schools use the, there's an 8-9 test and a 9-10 PSAT, a grade 11 PSAT, and an SAT, right? So for those schools that use these tests on the continuum, you can generate growth reports to track a specific student's growth towards these particular goals. So you should know that it's there. This way of tracking um, college and career readiness at a high school level is very useful. I know that the schools that have, that do pay for the 8-9 PSAT, the 9-10 PSAT, they're having great results with it. And it's a really, really, you know, we, we definitely have a dearth of um, useful assessments, I think, uh, at the high school level. So I, I do think that this is very valuable. So this is the growth report. All right. So that was all, everything I just said, if there's no more questions, refer to the College Board reporting. Very briefly, I'm going to show you iPlatform because at the high school level, you can get information um, around your college and career readiness and your academic achievement through iPlatform. I, Mike just did a training um, with the Department of Ed staff last week. And we, we are very grateful to the Department of Ed for iPlatform because it's a great, great tool. 
Um, so I'm going to show you just a quick encouragement to go on to iPlatform to check out what you can see there. So I'm going to talk a little bit about iReport. And this is all of the, the information on iPlatform is public. I did not include the names of the schools that uh, the data reflects, but I could have. Um, but this is showing you right here, you can get, this is a high school report, right? That will show you a tremendous amount of aggregate data. It'll, sh and, and you know, here it says COVID because this year's scores are not in and last year's scores are unavailable. So a lot of the information from last year just says COVID for achievement, but you should know um, that you can get educator profiles here. You can get growth measurement here, the financials cost per, pu per pupil, total expenditures for a specific school, um, some different information about school environment around suspension, expulsion, class size, and so on. So I'm just going to show you here, this is for achievement, right? So here is a specific school um, for, uh, although actually this, I think I, this is, might be erroneous. Um, this is a school profile, I'm sorry. On this specific school, there's 1,300 students. You get the proportion of male and female, the demographics, okay, of the ethnicity and races. Um, population breakdown, English language learners, 20%. And here is what I was talking about earlier, um, the report on achievement. So again, you know, we don't have 2020 scores, but you can see here, it'll give you, this would be, you know, this year's current scores for achievement levels right here in the bottom, whoops, in the bottom left corner. This is their achievement by subject in the upper left corner. We have their proficiency in context, okay? So it reflects from the, um, against the district as a whole. And then over here, we have the proficiency trends, okay? So for instance, you can see here for ELA proficiency, and this is based on the 11th grade SAT from the school site because it's our state assessment for 11th grade. And you could just see here that in 2017, 50% were proficient. And this is going a little bit down to just under 50%. Okay, so you can look at those trends. And this speaks to college and career readiness. Um, again, over time, it shows you 2017 through 2020. And um, you can see here, it has to do with graduation rates, provides you the context, right, for that particular school, the dropout rates compared to the district as a whole, and the college and career readiness, right? So it tells you how four-year graduation rate, five-year graduation rate, and then the percentage of kids that enroll and, and drop out. So it's just, it's really good information for your, um, for your high schools. This last report in iReport allows you to compare, and I did compare here the three different um, Manchester high schools, right? So you can get an overall um, profile. So it's a little small, um, and I encourage you, would I give the website again? Okay, it's um, iPlatform. So I'm going to write in um iplatform and you can google iplatform new hampshire or go to the new hampshire department of ed and go directly to iplatform okay um you can look here at a comparison of profiles comparison of the school environment these are all the variables that we were just talking about here we have student achievement at the different levels and again right for for 2020 student achievement was impacted by covid so that's not in there the academic growth would be in there but you can see here, you know, slight differences amongst the different high schools. And, this, and so you can um, put in any variables that you want. So you could, if you have a small high school in the, you know, in the middle of New Hampshire of low socioeconomic and um, stat status, then you can put in two other high schools that have similar dem demographics and socioeconomic status and sort of compare how your school is doing. 
Um, okay, iExplore uh, is another part of iPlatform. And this allows you, and again, there we have a recorded webinar on our website that goes into far more depth for um, iPlatform. And this is, again, this is a platform that was developed by the New Hampshire Department of Education. It's yours for free. It's a, it's a really wonderful platform. Um, this is, you can, you can compare your performance, your achievement indicators against hundreds of other indicators around finances, special ed population, ELL population, size, um, anything that you want. And so that's basically what you can do here. And you can see here, um, you can do it for many schools. You can do it for just a handful of schools. You can, there's, you can play with this to your heart's content and get all sorts of amazing information here. Okay. The very last place that you can view your SAT data. And again, I think this is great for accountability. Um, I think it's great to be able to look at your SAT data against other data in Performance Plus. You know, you might have other common assessments in Performance Plus. The AP testing goes into Performance Plus, so you can see your SAT scores against your AP test scores. Um, you can put grades into Performance Plus, so you could look at your SAT scores against your student grades. Um, but for now, really, uh, what student what performance plus does not go into is the depth that the college board reporting does you just get an overall score and a proficiency level you Karen, can all, yes I'm sorry yeah. do you know if i platform shows private has private school information i can check it's a great question i'll Watch check it. thank you um Anne's going to check on that the other thing that you can do in P plus is that you can view the SAT data by groups, right? So you can look up your SAT results um, for IEP students and non IEP students, for EL students and non EL students. You can look at your SAT, SAT results um, per student absences, per um, uh, student transients. You can do a study of, I mean, you know, so you, we all, and those of you that have used Performance Plus know that you can analyze this data by any of your demographic filters in, um, in Performance Plus as well. All right, that's just another image. We have our pie charts. There's a lot of different ways to look at Performance Plus. So I'm just checking the time. I'm gonna keep moving. Hopefully I wanna get you some, just some good protocols and things to, to look at this data. Um, you're gonna look at this data in data teams, right? So you probably have a district level data team that will be using this data. You probably have a school level team that will be using this data. In the work I've done at high schools, I've oftentimes looked at this data first with an administrative team with representatives from each of the disciplines, assistant principal, principal, and we would look at it together. Um, and together we would identify areas of strength and weakness that we found in the data. After we did that, we would bring that back to department teams and do an analysis, you know, in English and social studies, I might get those cross-disciplinary teams together and have them look at the data for those content areas, um, take them through the conclusions that we came to, and then have them do the item analysis part and the planning for instruction and changes for instruction that they uh, deem would, would deem appropriate. Okay. So just, I guess, you know, this is what DS, part of what DS is all about. We really advocate using protocols we really advocate looking at data collaboratively and strategically and responding to it is and rigorously and responding to it um, in a very diligent and um, just keeping to protocols with fidelity because that's how you get the good work and that's how you come to to honest and comprehensive um, conclusions that's how you get to root cause analysis 
And um, these are protocols that we have that are on our site that you're more than welcome to. If you, um, I think actually what I'll do is I'll put these protocols in the folder for this session and in the link to the certificate, you can get some of these protocols to use. This is an overview of the protocol. It's not rocket science. It's, I'm sure many of you on the call have used protocols like this or similar protocols. Um, you know, we predict alone and then together we share, we observe alone and then we share our observations. Then we talk about, hmm, what, why? I wonder why, could this be a reason? Could this be a reason? What do you think of this reason? We do that alone and together. And then we talk about, well, what does it mean? What does it mean for our practice? And then we come up with a goal, right? So if, I mean, let's say last year, 65% of our kids were proficient in words in context, um, but 40% really sort of tanked on a lot of those medium questions. You know, what are we, what kind of bang from our, for our buck are we going to get? I think words and context is a huge bang for your buck because it's a cross-disciplinary skill. So, you know, your SMART goal might be to bring 65, to, sorry, to bring 80% of your students to proficiency in, you know, around words of context. So it's, it's a, um, it's a mix of identifying areas that are, that need strengthening but then also evaluating what, what's the biggest bang for our buck. And, and that's a conversation. Okay, and then there's some reflection at the end of the protocol. Aaron? So, yes, ma'am. Um, private school data is not included unless okay. you are, if, you're, if you have students from your district who are placed in another, in a private school out of district. Thanks, Sam. Then there's data, okay. okay. Thank you. Um, and this is just a, basically modeling what I was just talking about, right? So over here, um, the current situation is that 32% of students were on track for college and career readiness in expression and ideas. And that shows that to you in the green on the right-hand side. And then this particular building created a um, uh, you know, a smart goal of they were going to go from 32 to 42 percent of students will be on track for college for expression of ideas. OK, in the next assessment day, school day assessment, SAT. So that's what we mean when we talk about smart goals. And this just goes through that process of making predictions, you know, so what do we think? And it's really I would not skip that step. It's a very engaging step and it's an important step because what the predictions reveal is all of our assumptions and biases and the things we think we know about our students. And I will, I will tell you that every time the staff is surprised at what they perceive to be true versus what the data shows. So don't skimp on your predictions, okay? And after you're going to, I mean, this is taking you through the process. I sort of talked about this, but you know, you're going to log in, you're going to look at your instructional planning report together. Um, you're going to choose the SAT school day, create your report. You're going to download this. Okay. You're going to, you know, go back in, make, make your observations, your predictions. How did they, um, of course, you're not going to look at the data before you make your predictions. You download the report and look at the report, and then you make your observations. And then your next steps, you know, does it make sense to analyze some items that are associated with your students' performance, low, lowest performing areas? And so that's what I talked about earlier. You use the instructional planning report, you make your observations, then you go back into the college um, board reporting portal to look at the items and try to learn, you know, what items do they omit? Why are they omitting items? Is it because the items are at the end of the test? Is it because the items are open-ended items? Okay, so what does that mean for our instruction? Certainly, open-ended items, if they're leaving those out, there's a lot to work with there in your classroom instruction. Um, what do we need to do about test prep if they're doing poorly at the items at the end of the test? 
Okay. So there's, there's a lot of different strategies and you definitely, I, I wouldn't focus on teaching to the test because there's way too much rich instructional material that can be taken from the SATs. But at the same time, you do want to keep in mind, you know, those test taking strategies. And for some students, depending on your curriculum and how, how um, accustomed students are to taking assessments like this, there is a place for, for some test prep as well. I'm going to move through these quickly. We are, um, you know, we're getting to the end of the session. So, and I've been talking a lot about this. So this sort of shows you. Um, and this just tells you you're going to filter to find the, the items that are in the area of weakness that you identified in that instructional planning document. And if they're not available, you can find similar items, like I said earlier, in a different administration of the SAT or the PSAT. So you're going to view those items. These are some examples. And then you can come up with a SMART goal. And this is just an example. This particular school, 20% more of fantasy high school students will be in the meets category, okay? And this is what they decided to do. Teachers will pre-teach tier three discipline specific vocabulary. All classroom teachers will utilize, utilize interactive word walls for established grade level academic vocabulary. That's tier two vocabulary. And they will, all classroom teachers will learn and leverage vocabulary strategies to help students make meaning while reading discipline area text. So these are all cross-disciplinary school-wide goals that, ever, that can really bring your different departments together if you manage it correctly. And I love that part of this. Okay, we're right on time. Um, write in any questions. Anne and I will also stay on after. I want you to know that there are lots of other data focused webinars that the New Hampshire Department of Ed has supported and is delivering to you on our YouTube site. Okay, so you can YouTube demonstrate success. And these are some images here. There's, you know, a session on professional learning communities, there's a session on um, DOE, different systems of support. This um, this particular webinar was also done in January. So there's another recording of that. There's iPlatform. There's tons of great stuff. So just go to um, our YouTube. And that's it. If you have questions, you can always access Melissa White of the New Hampshire Department of Ed or me or Anne. Okay. Anne, do you have anything to add? don't have anything to add but if you want to ask a question with your voice you can raise your hand on the panel and we'll see that and we will unmute you and you can ask and we'll stay on for a couple minutes to see if anybody has questions everybody is so silent hmm. all right everybody yeah people are starting to get off so okay okay all right Thank you. All. be well Bye. Thanks so much bye, bye.